All right, welcome to part two of Ask the King for January 29th, 2015. This is episode 48. If you did not see part one, be sure to check that out on YouTube. But let's continue on because we've got tons of questions to get through, all right? Our next question, <clears throat> this one comes from Sir Dies a Lot, and he asks the following. He says, Phil, for the reimagination of Project 7, would you consider adding some fans to the mix by, let's say, maybe some voice acting of a certain character or something of like that? I think that would definitely add more variety to the series, and it could bring the community between you and your fans uh, more, more together or more close together. Um... Actually, and you may be surprised at this, although many people might not if you've been a long-time viewer, when I was doing Project 7 originally, that was going to be part of it, and even the reboot that I did years later, that was going to be part of it. Fan interaction was actually going to be a key part of Project 7, where I was going to have people maybe who were like, oh, they could send me a video of them on webcam or whatever. Oh, I'm going to try to help Phil or save Phil, or I'm going to mess with the Death Face character and, and interfere. Uh, at the end of the Pro Project 7 reboot series, I was going to have an episode. Yeah, I was actually going to go, go all out, and probably at a convention or whatever that I was attending, I was going to have many of my fans who showed up at the convention film scenes where we all do stuff together. So <clears throat> that was actually always an idea of mine for the series, and then neither series really got to the point where I could implement that, all right? Um, with this new Project 7 reboot, I'm going to be, be honest with you guys, because I know some people have been asking about it and saying, what's the status and what's going on with it and how's it going to work? It's going to start like uh, a comedy series where you're going to be seeing me do skits and doing interaction with uh, certain characters and such that are going to be involved in it. Uh, before we maybe even get to any gameplay, because I really feel that having the, the spirit of the series be about comedy and writing and bad acting and that kind of stuff like the original series was should be what it's focused on not on oh phil's playing a game you know what i mean uh so what i think i'm going to do is maybe have a few setup episodes get the premise of the series rolling and then once the series is finally rolling then we can say okay well on each episode maybe we have a special guest who could be involved or something like that keep in mind it's an interesting premise but at the same time i haven't written the series out to that point, yeah, I definitely have milestones in the series of things that I'm planning on doing, but not necessarily things that I've set in stone that this is what I'm going to do, okay? I'm very excited to redo Project 7, or not redo, but reboot Project 7 uh, for its original intention and purpose. That's going to be coming in February. At least I'll be working on it in the month of February. I don't want to promise anyone that, oh, it's definitely coming out episode 1 or anything like that. I think you're going to like it once it's out, but I think a lot of people may... I, don't, I just want to... Up front, I got to tell you this, it's not going to be like that series from 2012 where it was amazing with all these graphics and a great editing and every... No, 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 no. That's not what it's going to be. It's going to be very different, but I think that people will still find it entertaining, okay? <clears throat> More on that coming up soon. All right, next question. Uh, hey, Phil, I know you've been doing... You, you've, excuse me. I flubbed that one. I know that you've been a long-time gamer making videos on YouTube. But have you ever just sat down and played a game without going on YouTube? Like I said, I understand that your job is making uh, is making games on. I guess he means making gameplay footage on YouTube. But have you just sat down with the controller and just played a normal game without it being uploaded anywhere? And that's from a Roman three eighteen. Um. <clears throat> yes, and no. What I mean by that. Have I played games offline, completely offline, that you have not seen me stream or play, like, a video of? Yes. But those games are few and far between. Those games are usually games that I'm playing when I'm traveling, like if I'm on a plane or something. And uh, usually it's not anything that I probably would have done a playthrough of anyway. So, for example, while I've had my YouTube career, I played a ton of JRPGs on the Nintendo 3DS. Uh, I actually played some games on the PS Vita when it was new. Uh, I played just more recently, I was playing games like that, the, uh, the Zelda, I can't even remember what the name of it is now, the one that was the, the link, the sequel to The Link to the Past, I seriously can't even remember the name of it, that's how long it's been since I played it, but I was playing that when we, when came out here last year to check out Seattle, I was playing that on the plane and stuff, and I got pretty far in it, well, not really pretty far, probably not even halfway, but, uh, yeah, that's the kind of opportunity that I take to play games. Now, when I'm here at home and I'm not traveling, usually, I'll be honest, I'm doing some kind of a mobile game. Whether it's, I told you, I already told you in part one, I was playing that Injustice app for a long time, then I moved over to WWE Supercar, now I'm playing WWE Immortals. I like games that I can play them, but they're kind of almost mindless. 
where I could do it, but I could also be watching TV, I could be watching a movie, I could be doing something else with Leanna, and then I'm kind of doing it as a side thing rather than me focusing all my attention on this game. You know what I mean? Because when you're doing that, now you're super hyper-focused and now you can't pay attention to anything else. Um, so that's really the answer. Have I actually done a serious game that I never, you know, since I did YouTube or, or Twitch and I did it and I didn't broadcast it? No, because here's the thing. This is the perfect combination of fun and work for me. I can't tell you how many games over the past few years because you guys recommended it that I played that I either never heard of or never would have given the time of day and I played it and I loved it. I was at Silent Hill. I never would have played that game if people didn't say to play it and I played the, the whole trilogy of originals and I fucking loved it. So that's the kind of thing is that I'm, I'm enjoying these games off or online with you and you're liking it too so why not if I'm going to enjoy a game do it and record it and make money off of it while I'm enjoying it and that's kind of been my philosophy. Okay. All right. Um, next question. This one is from Asherman4201. And he asks the following. He says, uh, Hey, Phil, I'm a longtime viewer since the days of the original Dark Side Phil channel on YouTube. What is your take on pre-ordering of games? Do you think that the pre-ordering of games is hurting the industry as developers are offering essential DLC packs as incentives to pick up the game on day one for full retail price? For example... By pre-ordering Dying Light, it gives you an entirely new game mode to anyone that pre-ordered it. Okay then. Um, great question by Asherman4201. And this has become a huge topic of controversy in the gaming world over the past year in particular. And here's why I say that. When you go to GameStop, you got to pre-order, 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 pre-order. You go to the website to buy a game. Pre-order, 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 pre-order. You go on PlayStation Network or Xbox Live to their stores. Digital pre-order, digital pre-order, digital pre-order, pre-order. And I hate to say it, but in this day and age, and I talked about it this past year in the worst gaming trends, the games that are being released aren't complete. When you get this game... It's got bugs, it's got issues, it, the multiplayer doesn't fucking work at all, it won't wor load properly, it deletes your saves, the frame rate's terrible, and it's like, you wanted my pre-order money. Basically, I gave you my money in advance saying I am basically pledging to you that I'm going to buy your game at retail, and you couldn't do me the service of giving me a functional fucking game at retail, and I had to wait a month for you guys to put out a patch for the game to even be playable. And this is a big problem. Okay. In addition, how many people pre-order these games, put money down, and then later on change their decision and say, I don't want to pick up that game, or that game ended up being reviewed poorly, and they end up either going to the GameStop, and the GameStop's like, well, we're not going to refund your money, but you can easily transfer that over to another game. Basically, once you pre-order a game, that money is the retailers, period. That money is in their pocket. That's profit for them. And then if you actually ever come back and buy the game, they could give a shit. But they got your five bucks or whatever it is that you put down on that game, right? Now, of course, there's a flip side of that where there's a lot of these websites. Like I know GameStop.com, you can pre-order games without ever being charged. But I actually heard that if you don't cancel your pre-order before the game comes out, you get charged anyway, even if you never pick it up, which is kind of ridiculous in my opinion. W what the fuck? You, what did you give me? I never picked up the game, so what was the pre-order money going towards? Um, but I think in particular... A lot of people are up in arms with these pre-orders because, oh, if you pre-order here, you get an exclusive game mode. So if you didn't pre-order the game, you don't get the game mode. Now let's think about this. Dying Light is a good example. Here's a game that it said if you pre-order the game, you get an exclusive game mode you can't get if you don't pre-order it. All right? But there were no reviews of the game before the game came out. In fact, they didn't even ship out copies of this game to people to, to review in advance. So no one knew what the game was or how it was. Now, we knew it was from the makers of Dead Island. So, okay, it's kind of like Dead Island, but no one knew exactly what this game was going to be, right? It was kind of a mystery. Now, here we are three days into the week from the release of Dying Light, and may most people are panning the game, saying it's Dead Island with next-gen graphics and a parkour aspect. But it's repetitive, it becomes boring after a few hours, there's nothing original about the game, what the fuck, why would anyone want to buy this unless they're such a hardcore fan of Dead Island that they want to play the same game again, only this time in a more urban setting than in jungle setting. And okay, that's great, but now if you pre-ordered the game, I want to cancel my pre-order, well that money's already GameStop's. So now you got to transfer that over, and this is the catch-22, is if you don't pre-order the game, you don't get the exclusive content, but... 
you don't get a review. So you don't know if that game was even worth your time. So you're putting your money down in the, the hopes that the game ends up being good. And if it's bad, you kind of get screwed out of your money. So there's a lot of controversy. Uh, basically, it's a lot of controversy regarding it. What is a pre-order? Is a pre-order a guarantee that you get a game on release day? Is it? Because I think that's what it used to be. A pre-order, when you went to a store and you put down your money and said, here you go, it was a guarantee that if you came to that store on release day, you would get a copy of the game. And that's all it was, right? Then all of a sudden, somewhere along this time, it became, well, now you get exclusive DLC for pre-ordering, you get game skins for pre-ordering, you get in-game currency for pre-ordering, and it changed, and what ended up happening is retailers and game developers started using this as a means to create hype for their games and get extra sales. All right. Now, here's one thing that I don't fucking understand at all, and I got to call bullshit on it, especially after a situation that happened to me this week. Digital pre-orders. All right. Digital pre-orders. So I got to ask right up front, what the hell is a digital pre-order? Because like I just said, a pre-order means that you're putting down money to make sure there's a physical copy of the game at the game store so you can get it on release day and play it as soon as possible. If a game's being released digitally... You can get it as soon as it's released digitally. There's no physical interaction that has to take place. So what the fuck is a digital pre-order? All you're doing is giving your money to PSN or Xbox Live or whatever it may be early for a game that you can buy anyway. So what the hell? And then, of course, well, there's incentives. If you get a digital pre-order, maybe you'll get a theme for your console. In some cases, like what they're doing with PSN and Xbox Live, well, you can pre-download the game early so it's on your console. So at the crack of midnight, you can play it immediately and not have to worry about, oh, you have to download the game, everyone trying to do it at midnight, and now the internet's slow because of it or whatever, all right? So digital pre-orders seem to be pretty much the worst case of this whole pre-order fiasco. And the problem is, a lot of times, people are getting fucked. Case in point, I'll give you one direct example from my experience this week. I pre-ordered the Grim Fandango remaster on PlayStation 4. Why? Because it said you could get it the day before, which I wanted. I wanted it on my console and ready to launch, so that on launch day, I could easily, peace of mind, just launch it and we're ready to go. Okay, that's why I really got it. Now, of course, in addition to that, I guess I got a theme for PS4 or something, which I haven't even used. Sony completely fucked up the launch, okay? If you pre-ordered the game, you couldn't get it. You could only get the game if you bought it outside of the pre-order. Because if you pre-ordered the game, what happened was at midnight, when the game was supposed to go live, the game did not download. Instead, it auto-downloaded the activation code for the game, but not the game. So your console thought the game was installed and you had license to play it, but the game didn't exist. So then if you went to re-download the game, you couldn't because the console thought it was on the console. To make matters worse, you couldn't delete the activation code, so you couldn't tell your PS4 that it wasn't there. And as of right now, you it's still fucked up for what I'm to understand. You still was never fixed by Sony. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. Now, this is just one example. I'm sure that Microsoft has flubbed it and Steam has flubbed it and everyone's flubbed it. Digital pre-ordering? What's the fucking point? If the game's available, give it to me. If it's not, don't. But don't take my money and fuck me. I paid $15 for Grim Fandango Remastered on PS4. I still haven't gotten the product. And I've had to go buy it on Steam. And I'm playing it on my PC now. Because I didn't want to wait. I wanted to play it. <clears throat> so, it's absolutely ridiculous. Right? It's absolutely ridiculous. And I can understand all this controversy and uproar about, wow, what the hell happened with, with these pre-orders. And what's the... They, they 1 million percent benefit the retailer. And probably 1% benefit the gamer. Because if you're going to go physically pick up the copy of the game and you want guarantee that that copy of the game will be there on launch day, it, 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 it benefits you. But now you, don't, you didn't decide on if you want to buy a game until two days after when reviews came out. Oh, by the way, you don't get any of the exclusive content because you didn't pre-order and there's no way to ever get it again. What? So this is it, but the industry is using the pre-order as a, a means to judge sales. They were, they were touting games like Destiny, the most pre-ordered game in history. But that doesn't mean your game is good. It just means you hyped the fuck out of it and people thought that it was good because you hyped it. Not that the game actually was played and was, was deemed good. It means nothing. It means money in your pocket and it is totally anti-gamer making a statement like that. So I definitely understand the uh, controversy around pre-orders. I personally pre-order games that I want to physically have copies of. <clears throat> but 
more and more these days, I am finding myself going for the digital version. Uh, simply because it's the convenience of not having to drive to the game store to pick up a physical copy of the game. But on the flip side of that, I don't get any trade-in value when I do a digital version of the game. So it's kind of like, what is your life situation? Do you have lots of money to throw away? You know, and you could just do that without having to worry about ever trading in games again and getting some money back? Get the digital version, right? But I don't know. I, I digress. I definitely understand the controversy. Uh, my thoughts are they are definitely pro developer, pro retailer, and very, very little bit of pro gamer in there, okay? Okay, next question. Uh, let's see here. This one I'll just make quick because he had a book paragraph about it, but basically a lot of people ask me this, but in particular Trinity11 asked me, will I be playing the new Monster Hunter? Why and why not? Um, I've never played a Monster Hunter game. That's the bottom line. I don't. I almost know nothing about it at all. I, it's one of those series, I believe, didn't they come out in the PS era, right? Or wasn't it in the handhelds during that era, the PlayStation 1, 2 era? Then I missed out on it. Now, this is like the fourth version of the game or whatever. And I think, it came, didn't it come out last year and I didn't even play it for Wii U? I don't even know. But I guess it's coming out for 3DS and people are asking, am I going to be playing it? From what I understand... Keep in mind, this is completely by hearsay. I could be talking straight out of my anus, and I'll make that a preface because I, there's times when I do this, and then people say, well, Phil was completely misinformed, and he just he's an idiot. I'm just speaking off of what people have told me about the game, so I could be completely wrong here, and I'm prefacing this by saying this. I've heard the games are very long. They take a lot of time investment. There's a lot of learning curve if you've never played one of the games before, and they require grinding. Now, I could be wrong on any of those points, but if that's true... Number one, that doesn't even sound like it lends itself to a good playthrough. You know what I mean? A longer style, grinding style action RPG that's going to take a million years to get through. I just got through games like Far Cry 4, uh, Kingdom Hearts 2, D Dragon Age Inquisition, which took me over two months to be. I just played a ton of longish games. I don't want to necessarily jump into another game that's going to take me five weeks to five months to be. Um, <clears throat> in addition... I know that there is a, a you know, a, a, a kind of a hardcore fan base for the game, but I'm not one of them. So again, I don't even know what to expect. And chances are, if I try to learn the game on the fly, I'll get, oh, Phil didn't ever play this game. Here comes another, you know, montage of Phil sucking at a new franchise that he never played before, even though everyone else played it. He didn't even know that to use a healing item, he has to open up two menus, hold three buttons, and spin in fucking place. We all knew that. <laughs> so why put myself into a position for a game that I haven't heard a lot about, I don't know if I'll really enjoy, might not lend itself well to a playthrough, and I'm probably going to suck at. And that's kind of the perspective I'm taking when I'm looking at Monster Hunter. Now, I could be completely wrong because I'm speaking from speculation. If you think that this is a kind of game that I would definitely like, a game that wouldn't be an insane grinding time investment, a game that people would, would like to see the playthrough of, and I won't suck terribly at it, let me know. But from all intents and purposes where people have told me, that's the case. So why would I check out Monster Hunter? That's just what I'm saying. Let me know your your uh, feedback on that, okay? Okay. Next question is from Atlas Damask. And he asks, Hey, Phil, if I recall correctly, summers are usually your downtime for major game releases. Would you perhaps consider playing the original Saints Row or maybe try out Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep? Now, a million people have asked me, when am I playing Birth by Sleep? So I decided to actually uh, address that, Okay in this particular video because I want people to understand the, what's going on with Birth by Sleep. A lot of people really liked that I played Kingdom Hearts 1. I think even more people liked that I played Kingdom Hearts 2 because I approached it a different way. I didn't try to rush through it and I really enjoyed Kingdom Hearts 2. Um, I want to play Birth by Sleep before I play Kingdom Hearts 3 because from what I'm going to understand, it's critical backstory. It is a prequel, but it kind of ties a lot of things together that happened in Kingdom Hearts 2 that I didn't necessarily understand. And if I play it, it'll give me the necessary backstory to have everything as an understanding in my mind moving into Kingdom Hearts 3. But we don't know when Kingdom Hearts 3 is coming out. We have no clue. Nintendo is not giving us any kind of a, a hint. Well, not Nintendo, excuse me, uh... Square Enix is what I meant to say. I don't know why I said Nintendo. Ugh. We don't know. We don't know. Um, let's say Kingdom Hearts 3, halfway through this year, E3, it gets announced it's coming out summer of next year. Sounds like a great time that between that announcement and Kingdom Hearts 3, I'll play Birth by Sleep. But I just played Kingdom Hearts 2. We've got plenty of other stuff. I'd like to do more variety of stuff to do right now. And that's what I'm really focusing on. Yes, I will eventually play Birth by Sleep, but it's not coming out 
<clears throat> anytime early, all right? Okay, now, the other game that he said was Saints Row 1. Would anyone want to see me play Saints Row 1? I don't know. I never played Saints Row 1. I, the first one that I ever played was Saints Row 2. That was actually one of my earliest gameplay footages. It wasn't even a full playthrough. It was just footage of certain scenes that I put up on YouTube. Um, if people actually would want to see me play Saints Row 1, I'd consider it, but I don't know if anyone would even care. So, again, that's something that I need your feedback on. Um, all right, next question. Oh, this is a good one because I have a, some significant stuff to say about this one. What are your thoughts about Club Nintendo shutting down at the end of June? And in particular, this was asked by God, uh, God Revan or Reven. I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce it. But this was a question that lots of people tweeted me about when it was announced that Club Nintendo is shutting down in the middle of this year. Some background, everyone. What is Club Nintendo? Club Nintendo is the fan service kind of fan club for Nintendo by which, number one, you get information about new releases. Number two, you get points when you buy Nintendo products. You enter them into this club. They accumulate and you can redeem those points for prizes. And number three, if you hit a certain number of points in a year, you become like a, a, a gold or platinum member and you get a special prize. All right. Now it started in June of 2006, was it? It was like the middle of the 2000s when this, this club started. I think they're saying it lasted nine years or something like that. And Apparently when the club started, Nintendo was so popular at that time because the Wii was like the biggest thing. They said, we want to get back. And the, there was like crazy amounts of good swag. In fact, if you ask John Rambo, he actually got this crazy, like accurate Mario replica hat that you can actually wear. And it's like Mario's hat from Super Mario Brothers. That's an awesome piece of, of collectability that maybe people would love to have. And the thing was, these were items you could only get through Club Nintendo. So they became insanely popular collectibles that were worth a ton of money. Over the past nine years, these rewards have gotten progressively worse every single year. When I started doing Club Nintendo, and I think it was like 2011 when I first started seriously doing it, my re big reward for the year was I got this cool collectible 8-bit pin set from Super Mario Brothers featuring all characters and sprites from Super Mario Brothers, but also it was little blocks that you could set up and do artwork and stuff with. It was really neat. In addition that year, I redeemed my codes for like a collectible card set, I think I had a calendar, like three or four neat things, a poster set that I had those posters hung up back in my condo in Connecticut. So those points were pretty valuable. The next year was a little bit less. The next year was a little bit less. And now it's come to the point, and I complained about this in the past year, Club Nintendo, all you can get with the points are digital downloads of games. And I'm not talking like, oh, wow, I can get Mario Kart 8. No. Oh, I can get, you know... The newest game from Nintendo if I get a ton of points. No. It's like old retro games that you could download on your Wii U or your 3DS that most people don't have an interest in, which is probably why they're giving them away in the first place. All right? So if I wanted to play Donkey Kong Jr., I would play Donkey Kong Jr. I'm not going to... I have all these points accumulated. Now you want me to, uh, you know, put them in for some digital download I'm never going to play. And that's the... Unfortunately, the case is Nintendo, all of a sudden this year, after a year of only having digital things, not even physical collectibles anymore, just made the announcement that Club Nintendo's going away. It's gone for good. They are going to have a new fan appreciation program starting later this year, but they have not explained it. They don't know... No one knows what it is. And basically, if you have a ton of Club Nintendo points saved up like me, I do. I have a shitload of points I never spent. They're worthless because they go away in June. There's no way to redeem them besides just digital downloads that you probably don't want. And I'm just stuck with my thumb up my ass saying, well, guess what? Worthless points. I put all those in for nothing. Now, supposedly... There's going to be a last final push come towards June where they will put up a ton of stuff they're giving away. So I have a ton of points, and I'll obviously let everyone know if I see, holy shit, great stuff on Club Nintendo as like a go, go out of business present or whatever. I'll let everyone know, but here's a program, perfect example. Started out amazing. Somehow along the way, Nintendo lost their way creatively with the direction of this program, and now they're getting rid of it for something different that we don't even know what it's going to be. What happened here? This was a way that people were, wow, I'm going to buy more Nintendo games, I'm going to put my points in, this is awesome, and it, it went into oblivion. What, where is it that Nintendo's profits are down so much that they couldn't even put money into the program, so they just said, well, digital releases are literally free, it's a digital file, minimal upgrade, or minimal upkeep to have a digital file be put into someone's game system, just give that away because we don't want to put any money into the program because we're losing money every year. Honestly, I think that's what it was. 
Um, let's see what happens with the new with the new fan appreciation program, whatever it may be, and we'll go from there and judge accordingly. And again, I'll let you know if anything new comes out of this in the couple uh, the coming months. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, from Last Rambo 341, he says, "Hey Phil, during the last generation, your console of choice for multi-platform games was the Xbox 360. Now in this generation, you've made the switch to Sony's PS4. Just out of curiosity, what made you decide on the switch, assuming that a multi-platform game's quality performance is equal among both systems? Listen, much like what happened <clears throat> in the era of the Xbox 360 and the PS3, the same has happened in the era of the Xbox One and the PS4." Initially, when you lined the consoles up, one console was superior to the other. So during the era of the Xbox 360 for the PS3, first of all, the Xbox 360's Xbox Live service had amazing chat functions, all kinds of social aspect, matchmaking was easier online with games, achievements were really cool, and the Xbox 360 came out first. It came out a full year before the PlayStation 3. When the PlayStation 3 initially launched, it was incredibly more expensive. It had things in it such as Bluetooth and stuff that people didn't understand the functionality of or why they needed it and they were paying extra for it. The online capabilities weren't as good as the Xbox 360 initially. Now over time, Blu-ray became the standard, so everyone said, well, I want a Blu-ray player, get a PS3, right? So value added. More headsets and things were released for it that weren't Bluetooth and actually sounded better, value added. The fact that the price dropped, value added. And the online capabilities of the system became on par with the Xbox 360, value added. And by the time of the end of the console's life cycle, the PS3 was held in higher regard and actually more people liked the PS3 than the Xbox 360. Flip it to the, this new current gener generation of consoles. Upon launch, the Xbox 360 had all these stupid things that were nerfed. You know what I mean? It, it couldn't even do surround sound out of an optical port. Uh, it had all these limit rumors of limitations and things that were going to be happening with games. You had to buy it with the Kinect, which was a huge mistake of putting extra money onto the price tag for a fucking piece of shit peripheral that ended up no one used, just as everyone predicted, right? So all these negatives about the Xbox One versus the PS4 initially had better graphics, had live streaming built into it from the get-go, was cheaper, didn't have a shitty, stupid Kinect that you had to buy. It seemed to have all these positives on launch. So everyone went for the PS4. Now, over the course of the life cycle of these consoles, is it possible that, yeah, things are going to improve? Yeah, in fact, I can tell you right now, concretely, the Xbox One has improved its dashboard, has improved all the things that were missing from it initially that make no sense have been added, including, I mentioned specifically, surround sound support. That's in there now. All the shit that was like, why the hell wouldn't this have been in the console at launch, is in it now. In addition, now you can buy it for cheaper, because you can buy it without the piece of shit connect that no one wants. So... Microsoft improved, just like the PS3, Microsoft improved the Xbox One over the past year to year and a half to make it a more attractive console for a lot of people. And they've been having these crazy deals where you can get bundles and get all the games with it. So right now, quite honestly, if you look, you know, easily, right, easily if you looked at Xbox One versus PS4 pros and cons, I think you'd have a hard time saying this one is definitively the better one over the other. I think they're kind of on equal ground. And it, it, essentially what's going to end up happening to determine what system is better are the console exclusives, which we're about to start seeing, right? We're going to see Halo 5 soon. We're going to see Uncharted 4 soon. We're going to see Gears of War return to the Xbox consoles. We're going to see Sony-branded stuff return. And that's going to be the definitive difference maker when you look at these two consoles. Um... So, right now, you ask me, well, Phil, why did you get everything on PS4? Because I started like that. Because the games were running better on PS4, because the PS4 didn't have the problems the Xbox One had. Yeah, now they're kind of equal, but I've already started getting everything on PS4, so why would I change? And that's really what happened a lot of the times in that last generation of consoles. Everyone already had the Xbox 360, everyone loved it, why change? And eventually people did change, but it took a long-ass time. So... Will eventually the game, the consoles be equal or even maybe Xbox One surpass PS4? Yes, but I'm just going along with if there's no difference, why buy the game for the other console if it's the same thing? Okay. <clears throat> Alright, next question is from Silton of Swing. And after this one, we may take a break because i got about one more page of questions left to go, and that could be perfect for part three. Uh, the Silton of Swing says, Hey Phil, 
What would you like to see from Street Fighter V? In terms of a couple things. Characters, story, gameplay, and modes. Four characters already have already been confirmed. Ryu, Ken, Chun-Li, and Charlie. And of course, probably Guile because of Charlie, who's kind of like a copy of Guile in some ways. Parries are now back in the game, but no modes have been confirmed. Uh, you could probably uh, expect online play in arcade, which is a no-brainer for any fighting game. Personally, I would like an in-depth tutorial, as I only picked up Street Fighter 4 when Ultra came out in 2014, and it was my first serious fighter. I don't want others to struggle as much as I did when it came to learning the, in the game initially. Um, well, this is interesting. Uh, what would I like, if I had anything I wanted in Street Fighter 5, what would there be? I mean, I could think of a million things. But the first thing that I absolutely have to say, which probably, unfortunately, still is not going to happen whenever Street Fighter V is released, is online play that's valid. And what I mean by that is a stable connection online play without lag spikes, without input drops, that actually feels like you're playing someone offline. I've not played a fighting game yet where I've felt that experience. Some games have gotten close. Street Fighter is not one of them, but... I've not had that. From what I've experienced, playing the game online, yes, can you learn fundamentals? Can you learn basic combos? Can you learn basic gameplay strategies? Yes, but when it comes to on-the-fly reactions, footsie spacing, you know, anything that's a reactionary kind of a tactic, you can't learn that online. You have to play offline because of the lag factor when you play online. <clears throat> that's number one. Unfortunately, I still don't expect that to ever happen in the United States at least because we don't have internet infrastructure that can support it. Our internet is poor. It's not government owned. Every internet company is in direct competition with each other, but that just leads to internet that's way different in different areas depending on what you can get. And unfortunately, I still foresee that no matter what happens, the game is going to suck online. That's just the reality. And at this point, I'll be honest, now that I'm a pessimist, but I think I've kind of lost what I now deem as an unrealistic expectation that online play for fighting games will ever be worthy of being considered competitive play all right um would i like a great story mode with a story in it rather than just a ladder mode yes street fighter has infamously been famous for not doing a traditional story they'll have like a clip of a story at the beginning then you fight 50 generic people it's really usually eight and at the end there's a boss fight and you get an ending it's over well, what about games that have implemented really complex and interesting story modes? Just recently, we had Mortal Kombat 9 and Injustice that had incredibly immersive story modes that was like watching a movie while fighting in it, and it was interactive, and it was really neat. Why can't Street Fighter do something like that, right? Uh, why can't... Well, they did. One of the features that I really liked about Street Fighter 4 was... Initially, when new characters were released, you had the, the training mode, but you also had the challenge mode where you can learn basic bread and butter combos and strategies for those characters. Now, the problem was those modes weren't changed, right? So what should have happened was, oh, there's an update. Well, now that mode updates to tell you what are the definitive changes that happened with this character, and that should be in-game. It shouldn't be, I need to go search on fucking YouTube for what Combo Fiend up uploaded this week. To say, oh, this is the change to the character and it's in some kind of a fucking really makeshift fact that was typed up. That shit should be put into the game. So if you have Ryu in the game, what's different about Ryu in Street Fighter V? Well, his fireball has different properties than previous Street Fighters. His Dragon Punch now has these properties. And it's it's shown to you, right? Not that you have to f figure this shit out. Or you have to go look sparsely on the internet until that stuff's available. But also, yes, if the bread and butter combos change, have a new tutorial, a new challenge mode that teaches you the new stuff with every iteration of the game. I'd like that, but I don't think that would ever happen. Um, let's face it, online play for fighting games is stale. It absolutely is. Because the one-on-one -on -one formula... It's, it's, it is what it is, and just sitting in a lobby with 10 people and having to wait... A half an hour to 45 minutes for your turn, and then you finally play, and you lose, and you gotta wait again. It doesn't work. We have to figure out some kind of a new mode, a new matchmaking system, a way that these people can constantly be playing and having fun with the game. In addition to that, give me some incentive to play the game, rather than just playing for the sake of getting points, and the points may unlock a title or something, right? When I play Injustice... I'm sorry, let me take that back. When I play Immortals now on this, this phone... I'm playing with a set number of characters. The more I play, I unlock more characters. The more I play, I unlock accessories for the characters that make them more powerful. Remember Tekken? 
Tekken did this recently, where you would earn all these points, you could get all these clothing accessories and everything for your characters. Instead of nickel and diming the consumer into buying 400 costumes, make those costumes unlockable by playing the game more. I'm just saying, there needs to be some originality thrown into these games to make them more incentive for people to play them, rather than, I want to be a competitive street fighter and get YouTube famous because I win matches, so I'm going to, you know, fucking play this game. No, we need to... We need to basically find a reason to get people addicted to these games that's not that. Alright? Um, Gameplay-wise, what would I like to see? A game without gimmicks. I'm going to be... I've said this before and I'll say it again. Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo is a game that I still regard as the best fighting game of all time. Is it perfectly balanced? No. Is it without its own foibles and gimmicks? No. But year in and year out... People find ways to win in that game with characters that maybe you thought at first were terrible. They find abusive strategies and things that you can use, and it rotates. And it's not like there was ever a definitive upper class tier that cannot be beaten in that game, right? But that's happened in every other fucking fighting game ever because they all have these gimmicks. Oh, focus, dash, cancel, bullshit, custom combo, fucking parry up the ass. Give me a game that's not about a bullshit gimmick that you abuse to win, and then maybe I'll like it. More Rules vs. Capcom 3, in my opinion, as a competitive fighting game, was one of the worst failures ever. Because it tried to bring back a series that, at its core, the series had all these foibles and glitches and things that became a core part of the gameplay. And when finally, when the series evolved after five plus years, it was a really competitive, high-level game that took a lot of hand-eye coordination and skill. Marvel vs. Capcom 3 became a gimmick game about getting one hit that led to a 100% combo. Oh, but someone might break out by doing, you know, their fucking X-Factor, and now all of a sudden they win the match. And that's the whole game. It's a flashy bullshit game. It's not a competitive fighter. It's a flashy game for people who want to watch the game. It's not for competitive gameplay. It's bullshit. The game is terrible. Give me a game that's not about that. A game that's about competitive gameplay. You need to put time in to learn the game, to learn the footsies, to learn everything, to learn the execution. Not that you double tap twice and get a fucking sure you can reversal with invincibility melody frames no you actually have to do the motion for the fucking move to have it come out so there's risk reward in the goddamn game that's what i want bring legitimacy back to fucking fighting games and stop being about the mainstream bullshit that i want to sell to every five-year-old out there who wants to be cool and play street fighter instead make it so that it's fun for them but it's competitive for others i had this idea for street fighter 4 easy mode for the young ones challenge difficult tournament mode whatever you want to call it for the serious players who actually want execution difficulty those kids can play the easy mode you can even do tournaments for easy mode and then you could have the competitive level over here don't force me to play a watered down game for the sake of the masses there you have it that's what i want in street fighter 5 don't water that shit down all right Whew. that is it everyone it's time for another quick break okay uh when we come back we got the final page of questions and that'll be the end of this episode of Ask the King. So don't go anywhere. I'll return shortly. If you're watching on stream, there's going to be a commercial break. If you're watching this on YouTube, well, stick around. There's going to be a part three. Jump over to that video. I'll be right back.